Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the Health First podcast. We are so happy to have Dr. Scott Cohen and Dr. Fiona Collins with us today talking about superbugs under a microscope, part two. In part one, we discussed what superbugs are, the origin of resistance, and reviewed the overuse and misuse of antibiotics. In this podcast, we will discuss considerations dentists should take for patients with heart and joint conditions, a historical perspective, adverse events, including antibiotic resistance, and some patient tips. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Scott Cohen. He is a participating physician at Bassett Healthcare Network, and Dr. Fiona Collins is an infection prevention expert. Fiona, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Well, as Marcy mentioned in our last podcast, we did talk about superbugs and antibiotic stewardship. And if you think about antibiotic prophylaxis, um, it's certainly key for some patients to receive that. Um, Others do not not need it compared to previously. But the other aspect is really, if you're following the guidelines, you're avoiding unnecessary use of antibiotics. So there certainly is a clear antibiotic stewardship aspect to this. Um, And as we look at that, there are two sets of conditions. And I'm going to hand it over to Scott to talk about those. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah, you know, when we're ta- in medicine, you know, and I'm a family doctor, both inpatient and ambulatory medicine. And in medicine, generally, when we're asked by dentists or, you know, even other health professionals what, about how we can prevent um, infections associated with procedures, it's typically, you know, heart infections, SBE or bacterial endocarditis, and or joint infections associated with usually knee or hip artificial joints, so-called arthroplasties. And, you know, those infections can be pretty severe. Bacterial endocarditis, it's very interesting if you look at it, you know, used to be caused, uh, we thought, by, you know, bad uh, dental infections and things like that. And in the past, we really thought it was related to, you know, dental work associated with these minor abnormalities of the heart valves. But we'll talk about that later, showing that that's probably not the case. Now, there are many more cases of bacterial endocarditis of the heart due to just random conditions, you know, poor dentition and things like that, than there are due to, you know, typically um, procedures associated with abnormal hearts. Um, The other side is now with the popularity of injectable heroin amongst the opioid use population, that is fast becoming a very, very common source of bacterial endocarditis. As far as, you know, joint infections post-replacement, I don't think we're 100% sure where those come from we think probably a lot of them do come from poor dentition um, and um, you know just inappropriate dental care, not inappropriate by the person providing care, but inappropriate in terms of the patient taking care of their teeth. Um, so that said, th- that's really what we're, we're talking about. And I can tell you from personal experience, the joint infections that we see in someone who has um, you know, a joint replacement, i.e. an artificial joint are just awful. I've had many patients who had to have the joint replacement removed a cement antibiotic impregnated spacer placed, and they really had antibiotics for months and months and months with no knee or no hip and wound up having to be in a wheelchair during that time period. It can be, you know, absolutely awful. That said, we really think that most of these infections are not due to dental procedures. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Fiona with, you know, what are the, what's the historical perspective in terms of the recommendations from our, our uh, societies? So thank you, Scott. There there are really quite a number of changes that occurred uh, between really 1997 guidelines and then the 2007 guidelines. If we go back even further, it's changed a lot more since then. Uh, But some of the key findings were the fact that indeed endocarditis is actually more frequently random rather than during dental and other procedures, which you had just mentioned. Um, Prophylaxis they found in looking at the scientific data and the evidence actually prevents few endocarditis cases. We also need to consider the risk of adverse events from antibiotics. And so we're looking at risk benefit and we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. Mm -hmm. The other thing uh, that will be near and dear to dentists and dental hygienists was the finding that optimal oral hygiene is key in endocarditis prevention, much more important than antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, in fact, there was a, a document just was just published in the April issue of Circulation, and it had an article by the American Heart Association. 
and they didn't make changes uh, or changed recommendations from 2007. They also again emphasized the importance of good oral hygiene as well as access to regular dental care. If, if we look historically at some of the uh, reasons prophylaxis were provided that were not, not recommended any longer in 2007, it's quite a number of things like the mitral valve prolapse, uh, rheumatic and other acquired valve dysfunctions. And I can remember um, in, in the prior days, looking at medical history forms, scouring them for anything that would require antibiotic prophylaxis. And it included a much larger range of re uh, recommended conditions in those days. Um, one being, for instance, rheumatic fever, which is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. So why not, you know, I honestly, Fiona, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here for a second. I guess I'd say, who cares? Why not just use antibiotics? I mean, what's the harm? Uh, okay, so maybe not a huge number of people given antibiotics um, to try to prevent um, bacterial endocarditis and or joint infections or health, but what's the harm? Who the heck cares? Uh, in response to being devil's advocate, one of the things, of course, is antibiotic resistance. And in a recent study, uh, they found that one of the four main reasons for dental prescriptions that were not needed was actually related to prophylaxis for artificial joints. There are other risks as a risk of allergic reactions. Um, anaphylaxis, of course, being the most serious one, which can cause death, but also articarial hives, which I know from personal experience is extremely unpleasant. And it was even more unpleasant to read that it doesn't always resolve. Um, so those are two examples. And I'm sure you have some other examples, Scott, of the, the risks and the adverse situations. Yeah, you know, in my practice, I, I see a lot of pretty significant side effects like GI. I had a patient today who had a, a tick, you know, long-term tick exposure. So really needed doxycycline. She doesn't tolerate it very well. We tried it anyway with just a couple of doses. GI side effects for antibiotics, very common. But the worst GI side effect that I see is uh, C. difficile colitis. And that is just an awful disease. Um, people can get really sick, wind up in the hospital. Um, it's just a very bad antibiotic associated colitis that is oftentimes preventable by either not using antibiotics or being more selective and not using a broad spectrum antibiotic, you know, like going to amoxicillin versus penicillin, which is narrowly selective. Um, but the side effects in general can be, you know, really, really awful. And, and obviously I was playing devil, devil's advocate before, but the reality is we see so many side effects with antibiotics that we really should avoid them whenever we can. Um, so, you know, I think moving on, addressing some of that, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Diabetes, or the American Dental Association, sorry, and the American Heart Association have really come out since 2007 with a huge change in recommendations. So what they did is they said, let's take the highest risk situations and prophylax for those, those that we really know do have a higher risk of uh, bacterial endocarditis and treat and others that we don't. So for example, if you look at the list that's left, it's very, very short of things that we prophylax with uh, antibiotics for dental procedures for bacterial endocarditis. One is prosthetic uh, cardiac valves, and that's, you know, um, a valve that's made out of metal or, or other than, um, you know, some sort of, um, you know, uh, tissue device. Um, prosthetic materials that are used to repair valves, we do recommend it for that. People who've had bacterial endocarditis, and just a few very specific abnormalities. One is unrepaired severe congenital heart disease. We call it cyanotic heart disease, congenital heart disease you know, like Tetralogy of Fallot, things like that, or completely repaired heart disease where there was prosthetic material used, but they only recommend that for the first six months after the repair, believe it or not. And also partially repaired congenital heart disease, heart disease you're born with, with residual defects, meaning there's some sort of still a hole or a problem with a valve or something like that. Um, they also recommend for people who have um, cardiac transplantations, who also have valve problems that they get uh, prophylaxis. Interestingly, you know, if you look at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Dental Association, they are both not recommending for prophylaxis for people with artificial joints. They say specifically consider not 
doing that for people who were getting prophylaxis for artificial joints. They don't make a frank statement, don't do it. They don't make a frank statement, do do it. They're just saying there's really isn't evidence to support doing that. I will say, you know, to Fiona's point, Fiona said, hey, listen, you know, back in the past, everybody with mitral valve prolapse, which is a lot of people, you know, were prophylaxed. We don't do that anymore. And I have a list of 30 other things, but I, I suffice it to say the two broad categories of congenital heart disease and people with prosthetic materials to repair valves are really uh, the ones that we are treating. People with just a murmur per se, we do not prophylax them if it's just an innocent physiologic or functional murmur. Uh, so that, that's actually a good tip uh, that we'll pass along and I'll, I'll hand it over to Fiona now for some other good tips to try to help you with uh, daily practice. Thanks, Scott. And before we talk about the tips, when we're talking about antibiotic prophylaxis and what it is needed for, or what it is recommended for, and we talk about dental procedures, uh, to be clear, we're talking about dental procedures that include gingival manipulation or mucosal incis incision. Those are the only ones. So as we look at tips, one of the things that uh, probably everybody is familiar with is the patient that arrives in the office for treatment and uh, forgot to take their profi forgot to take their antibiotic dose. There's a couple of uh, solutions to that. The first one is have them come early and have them take their dose in the office 30 minutes before their procedure. They can't forget it that way. Another option is it is ex considered acceptable in the recommendations that if the patient forgot that up to two hours after the procedure, they can still be given, uh, it's now post-procedural prophylaxis, but they can still be given that antibiotic dose. The, one of the other things that comes up is, well, the patient's already on an antibiotic for another condition. What do I do? The recommendation for that is to still provide prophylaxis, but to provide a different antibiotic. The last one is, what if I have a patient and that patient's coming in two days in a row? I've already given them their antibiotic prophylaxis. Do I need to do it again? And the answer is yes, you would repeat the antibiotic pro prophylaxis for the appointment on the second day. So really each time it's a single loading dose and it covers the period of potential bacteremia. Excellent. So I think we talked about, you know, um, the evidence and benefits of, of prophylaxis, reducing the risk of um, bacterial endocarditis and, and artificial joint infections. You know, to wrap it up, I think our goal here is just to say, listen, there are a, there's a huge problem with antibiotic overuse in the United States, which probably contributes to the superbug phenomenon that we've all heard about. So please just use, you know, wise antibiotic prophylaxis and when in doubt, consult with the patient's uh, specialist or primary care uh, practitioner. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to wrap it up today. Please stay tuned for our next uh, podcast coming up soon. And also um, you can take a look, look at all of our podcasts on healthfirst.com forward slash podcast. And there's a list there. Feel free to take a peek at those. And we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you.